I greet you in the name of our living Lord Jesus Christ. Dear friends, can you think of a time when people were really rejoicing over something, when they were really happy about something, a celebration? Maybe some of you go back to 1991 when we were victorious in Desert Storm and they had a big parade in Washington and everybody was celebrating. Maybe you go back a little further and remember that great victory of the American hockey team in the Olympics of 1980 when they beat the Russian team and everybody was celebrating and singing and joyful. Or maybe you just go back a couple of weeks ago when you watched the NCAA finals and saw all of the fans from Virginia when they won their first national championship stormed the basketball court and they were singing and they were shouting and they were dancing. That's what people do when they rejoice over something. They just, they can't stop themselves. They're dancing in the streets, they're shouting, they're singing. They're like kids at the last day of school getting out for the, the summer vacation, right? Well, picture this scene then, this morning. Picture the scene of Moses and the people of Israel as they're celebrating the deliverance that the Lord had given them. Miriam and the, the women have grabbed tambourines and they're dancing and shaking their tambourines and singing the refrain to the song that Moses has the privilege to be singing. I don't know what kind of voice Moses may have had, whether it was a good voice or bad voice, but I can guarantee you his words were perfect because they were divinely inspired. They're in the scriptures for us today. But why? Why such a great celebration? Why, why such a, a happy group of people? It's because, you see, these people had been enslaved. They were captives in Egypt for years and years. They had no freedom. They had no privilege of doing what they wanted to do. Their cruel overlords dictated their life. They were oppressed. They were tortured. They were beaten. They were exploited. It was not a fun life. But then the Lord came to their rescue. And He delivered them from their slavery. He crushed their enemies. And it was indeed a great Deliverance. Do you remember some of the details of the end of that deliverance? After those plagues, remember the ten plagues that caused Pharaoh and the Egyptians to literally push the people out of Egypt? Well, the Lord led them in the wilderness for a while, but he led them in kind of a circuitous path, making it look like they, they didn't know where they were going, that they were just kind of lost and, and wandering in that wilderness. That was part of God's plan because when Pharaoh and the people of Egypt saw the people of Israel just kind of wandering out there, they became emboldened again. And they got their chariots and they got their horses together and they went after the people of Israel. They were sitting ducks now and they were going to get those people of Israel and make them their slaves again. In fact, in Moses' song, did you hear how he kind of words what they were thinking as they came after Israel? I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoils, I will gorge myself on them, I will draw my sword and my hand will destroy them, they boasted. But they were no match for the Lord God of Israel. In his song, Moses calls the Lord a warrior. He talks about his strong right arm and he says he shattered the enemy. He threw down those who opposed him. His anger consumed them like stubble. Yes, dear friends, it was a great deliverance. For the Lord blew with his breath and the, the waters of the Red Sea parted. You see, Egypt thought they had them trapped because it was the Egyptian army and the Red Sea. There was no place for them to go. But the Lord blue and the seas parted and Israel went right through the waters on dry ground. But then when the Egyptians and all of their horses and all of their powerful chariots went down and chased the people of Israel, the Lord blew again. Only this time he blew the waters back and they covered the Egyptians. He hurled them into the sea and Moses' song ends, they sank like lead. <coughs> 
So you're thinking, what's this got to do with Easter Sunday? Well, there's two important things about this for Easter Sunday. One is that this great deliverance that God did for the people of Israel was part of his keeping his promise to Abraham to send the Messiah. That Messiah was to come from this people, the people of Israel, and they were to get back into their promised land. This was part of God's doing that, this great deliverance, and that's important to us today. But the other reason that it's important, maybe even more importantly for us today, is the fact that if Israel and Moses could dance and celebrate because of the great deliverance that they had received, you and I have even more reason to dance and celebrate and sing today because of the even greater deliverance that today marks for us. Because today marks the dawn of a new day. It's a day to celebrate. Because you see, we too, just like Israel, were enslaved. Here's how scripture describes the slavery that we were under, a much greater slavery than Israel's. It says, on this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. That shroud that enfolded all people, that sheet that covered everyone, is death. I know you don't want to. And I know that in our lives we try to delay it. But the reality is each and every one of us here today, each and every one of everybody that's in this entire world is going to die. And the reason that we're going to die is because each and every one of us is sinful. And we have the guilt of sin upon us. What can prevent that guilt of sin from taking you, from allowing death to put its steely hands upon you and draw you into its grip? Can being a, a great athlete or a famous actor stop it? Can keeping a life of good deeds, following family values to the, to the T, stop it? Can having a good job and a, a significant income stop it? Can lots of education and advanced degrees stop it? Can being faithful to your spouse and being married for 20, 30, 40, 50 years stop it? No. Nothing can stop death in this world. Even the greatest of the great of our society have succumbed to death. Albert Einstein, all of his wisdom, he couldn't stop it. J.D. Rockefeller, Howard Hughes, Steve Jobs, and all of their wealth couldn't stop it. Even all the goodness of Mother Teresa couldn't stop death. We have to look outside of this world for something to be able to rescue us, to deliver us from death. And that something is what God sent to us. The great deliverer, our Lord Jesus Christ. He is our warrior today. He is the strong and powerful arm of God. And here is what scripture tells us about him. It says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. The devil's work was getting us to sin. The devil's work was destroying us in death because he got us to sin. And not just physical death, but spiritual, eternal death. Death was consuming us. Death had enslaved us because sin consumed us and had enslaved us. But our Lord Jesus is our warrior. He came to this world in order to fight sin and fight death for us. In the last few days, we've seen his battle against sin and his battle against death on the cross where he paid for the price of sin for us. 
But the price he had to pay was death. Not just physical death, but spiritual death. Our hell on that cross. And Satan, he thought he won. He thought he was victorious because Jesus died on that cross and Jesus was buried. And you can bet the demons in hell and Satan himself were doing a jig in hell. They were celebrating. They thought they had the victory. But it was short-lived because a new day dawned the third day, Easter Sunday. Because that tomb was empty. When they rolled the stone away, there was no one in it because Jesus was alive. Jesus had defeated Satan once and for all. So Paul, in our other lesson for this morning, the words that are printed underneath the sermon box there, are the words that are our celebration song today. The song that Paul sang was, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, friends, that empty tomb screams to us that our sins have been paid for. They're done with. They can never be counted against us anymore. That empty tomb screams to us that Satan has been defeated, death has been defeated, because Jesus lives. And if Jesus lives, we will live. You may say, but wait, don't we still die? Yes, we still pass through physical death, but the scripture tells us that that isn't a death anymore for us, because it calls it a sleep. Our body only sleeps. We live. That's the great deliverance that God has done for us today. He's delivered us from the power of sin, which means he's delivered us from the clasping, icy steel claws of death that wants to draw us into hell for eternity. And no wonder there are more Easter hymns than any other kind of hymns. Why not celebrate? That's the greatest news and the greatest deliverance you could possibly imagine. That Satan is defeated. Death has lost. Jesus has won the victory. And we will live. So the Apostle Paul ends that section by saying, Stand firm then. Let nothing move you. Give yourself fully to the service of the Lord Jesus because your work in the Lord is never in vain. Stand firm. What are you standing firm on today? What, what gives you a foundation that's firm? Defenses against terrorism? Are you going to stand firm on our government that keeps wanting to shut down because they can't come to an agreement about any kind of policies? You're going to stand firm on universities which continue to tell us that we're nothing more than some kind of more developed animal? Are you going to stand firm on our economy, which doubles as a yo-yo? Are you going to stand firm on California weather in the hope there's never an earthquake again? Dear friends, that's standing on Easter eggshells. Our terra firma for our lives is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus lives, we will live. Because Jesus rose, you and I have life, real life, now life, not someday life, life now, real life that gives us purpose, gives meaning to our life, gives us something to live for and to work for in our lives. In this rat race of a world, you and I have a different perspective because we're looking for the day when our bodies will sleep and rise again. And that's something to celebrate. I don't have a shipload of tambourines to hand out to you today so that we can do our celebration together, but I'd like you to celebrate with me today, celebrate this new day that has dawned for us. And I'd like to do it this way. I'd like us to do that response that we did at the beginning of the service today, only I want you to do it 
with your heart so full of the joy of the new life that Jesus has won for you that your thunderous response to me would verily shake the rafters of heaven. Are you ready? He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen.